أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين نحمده ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه وخاتم رسوله النبي المؤيد والرسول الأمجد أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته ودعاءه وخيره زينوا أفواهكم بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد In our earlier discussion, which we begun last night, we began to analyze and present an overview where we compare the different approaches to understanding revelation. And we mentioned how in the Islamic sciences and in the Islamic way of study of the Quran and the Sunnah and religion in general, we have a few primary paradigms through which religion and religious concepts are understood. As far as our discussion on revelation is concerned, we presented uh, and are willing to finish that presentation in regards to three different paradigms. The theological paradigm, the philosophical paradigm and the mystical paradigm. Alhamdulillah, we finished an overview of the theological paradigm. We presented some of the key tenets and principles that govern the philosophical way of understanding. And tonight we hope to finish with the results of the philosophical understanding and also present the mystical interpretation of religion in general and revelation in particular. Before I move on with the philosophical interpretation, it's worth noting that although we said that scholars of theology or theo theologians, can you please recite a salawat for the sake of my mother because she made it tonight? Allahumma salli ala. They, the main source, the primary source of understanding religion and religious concept, what stands at the top for them is the Nas, the text, the scripture, the Quran and the Sunnah, the Hadith, correct? There might be a misconception here that does that mean that scholars of theology do not care about reason? Are they irrational people, illogical people? No, of course, to when we are substantiating our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can't go back to the Qur'an to prove that the Qur'an is from Allah. We can't go back to the Qur'an to say that Allah exists. We first have to, step one, prove using our reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. And then we can substantiate further claims and fall back on the Qur'an and the Sunnah for other items of our belief. So hopefully there isn't a misunderstanding when we said that scholars of theology rely on the Qur'an as their primary source, that means that they ignore reason. No, no. Reason has to be the foundation of everything. How they contrast with philosophers is that philosophers all along the way rely on reason, not just from the beginning. Whether they are proving the foundations or the later conclusions and secondary discussions, they seek to rely on reason solely and primarily and exclusively. But this does not also mean that a philosopher will not look at the Qur'an and the Sunnah. 
We have many of our philosophers, Muslim philosophers, as an example, they come to believe through reason that resurrection, when we die and we are born again, according to their philosophical arguments, they reason that it must be that we do not have physical bodies. They call this a spiritual resurrection. Their rational arguments lead them to the point that resurrection must only be spiritual. We will not have bodies, physical bodies. Yet some of them, having reached this conclusion, draw back. They say, look, we reached here according to reason, but when we read verses of the Qur'an, we have two choices. Either we completely read them metaphorically and say, when Allah talks about rivers, He talks about gardens, He talks about fruits, He talks about food, He talks about all these rewards and pleasures of heaven and paradise that are physical, either we're going to have to say, Allah did not intend these meanings, and read them metaphorically, which, which some of them do, they stick to their grounds, they stick to their guns and say, we're going to read these metaphorically. Others draw back and say, look, as far as my reason went, I think resurrection, yawm al qiyam and heaven and hell should only be spiritual. We shouldn't have bodies. But the Quran is too strong. The Quran, the verses of the Quran are too strong for me to want to read these metaphorically. So they take a step back and say, okay, maybe... My intellect made a mistake. I mentioned these two caveats, so we do not think that a theologian does not go back to reason. No, the basis of everything is reason. And on the other side, when we said philosophers rely on reason, this does not nullify that some of them will draw back from their arguments in favor of the text of the Quran and the Hadith. In fact, most of the philosophers try to combine these Combine their rational understanding with what the Qur'an presents. Let's go back to the meat of the discussion and complete our understanding of the philosophical paradigm. We said philosophers rely on reason. That was item number one. They rely on their reason. Item number two was that when they read verses of the Qur'an that have to do with extraordinary events and phenomena, like revelation, they read it metaphorically. That was item number two of their methodology. With these two put together, they produce their understanding of revelation. Some of the key elements of their understanding, one point before I go to the key elements, you may have heard in your reading of Islamic books, insha'Allah. I, just as a parenthesis, I made a reading list for anyone who likes to read, insha'Allah, all of you like to read, on my website, on my blog, which covers a variety of different books in English, good language in terms of the translation, if there are trans translations, where you can access and read. Parenthesis closed. Philosophers, as you may have encountered in your different readings, you have different schools of philosophy. Within philosophy, Muslim philosophy, you have different schools. Why there are different schools, I'm not going to get into it. But as a hint, it's because they start with different building blocks. What, If you remember, in our last session, we mentioned that philosophers begin with self-evident truths, with axioms, correct? And they build upon that. Sometimes, one philosopher, like Ibn Sina, for argument's sake, he will consider something to be axiomatic, meaning self-evident. It does not need any proof. It's obvious. But another philosopher, like Mullah Sadra, or Sheikh Sohrawardi, I'm just mentioning these names so you're just familiar with these names. He will say, I do not accept that statement that you consider to be self-evident and assume to be not requiring proof as self-evident. And that's why when the foundations are different, 
they end up having different kinds of philosophical frameworks. The methodology is the same. They, they still try to rely on reason, but they start to build different buildings. The appearance of the philo philosophical building, this construction that they are building on the foundation of their axioms, begin to look different because the foundations were very different. Despite their differences, I hope that's clear, despite their differences, philosophers agree on a few things when it comes to revelation. The, sen the, 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 the revealing of the Qur'an. Do you remember how we said theologians say the Qur'an is a top-to-down descent? Do you remember that? We said one of the key features is that the Qur'an descends from higher realms onto the heart of the Prophet. According to the philosophical understanding, it's the other way around. It's the heart and the soul and the spirit of Rasulullah traveling and traversing into higher dimensions and accessing realms that he acquires new information from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of Jibra'il coming down, it's Rasulullah going up. The heart and the spirit of Rasulullah traveling upwards to receive information. As an analogy, which is an analogy they of course use, in your dreams, when you have a truthful dream, a meaningful dream, they apply the same idea that your soul has traveled into other realms and is accessing information that is otherwise not accessible. In the same way that in our dreams we are accessing hidden realms and information that was otherwise hidden from us, Rasulullah, in the process of revelation, he is accessing higher realms. So the approach is down to bottom. And do you see how that kind of does not see exactly in line with the words of the Quran? Because the words of the Quran usually talks about descent. وَأَنزَلَ إِلَيْكَ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ Nazala, Inzal, these are sending down. But we already mentioned why a philosopher would read this differently because he says, look, revelation is not like the sending down of rain. Yes, Allah has used these words, but they symbolisms. What really is happening is the ruh of the Nabi, the Prophet, going to higher realms. So that's the first key point from the philosophical understanding that it's not top to bottom, top up to down, it's bottom to up. The second key observation is that angels are also immaterial. According to theology, they said, no, angels are material. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is immaterial. Everything else has a body. This is what the theologians were saying. Everything has a body, but what makes the body is different. Humans are made of earth, jinn are made of smoke, and angels are made of light. Philosophers say categorically this is wrong. Angels cannot be material and physical. Therefore, the interaction between Rasulullah and the angel of revelation ceases to become a physical interaction. Because the angel is immaterial. Therefore, the interaction will also be, at least to some degree, immaterial. And finally, the third philosophical conclusion, which is perhaps the most important one, is that revelation, divine communication that was received by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi, or the other Prophets, Musa, Isa, Nuh, Adam, Salamullahi alayhim ajma'een. They are not a different category to other spiritual experiences ordinary people have. Let that sink in for a second. Insha'Allah we all are going towards becoming very spiritual people. And maybe some of you are already in very high stations of spirituality. When individuals 
become very purified and they reach high stations, they start to have experiences. Their dreams become much more meaningful. In the same light, a philosopher would say, a prophet is a really, really strong spiritual person. His spiritual powers enable him to access areas of reality, higher dimensions that a normal person cannot. Not even a very strong, ordinary spiritual person. But a prophet is a bit different. Contrast this to a theological understanding. They say, no. Prophetic revelation is categorically different from all other human experiences. It is unique and completely different in nature. Don't compare this to dreams. Don't compare this to the experiences of highly spiritual individuals. Don't compare this to what you and I may experience in certain moments of our life and have inspirations and epiphanies. No, no, no. A, th a scholar of theology would stress that revelation is a unique phenomenon. And it differs from all other experiences we have. And the reason for that they have is that how do we know they're the same? It's not like you and I had revelation sent down to us. It's not like you and I receive communication from Jibrail. I don't. If some of you do, please let's swap places. Maybe you have more useful things to say. But the scholar of theology, he kind of has a point. We don't know what's going on with revelation. Therefore, we're not going to make conclusions that it's the same nature as dreams and as spiritual experiences. But because a philosopher likes to think in a system, yes, everything has to be consistent within the same paradigm. To say something is an exception feels a bit off. You know, in science, in physics, you create laws, you create the law of motion. Then to Come and say, look, there is an object that does not behave according to the laws of motion. Every physicist just gives you an eyebrow and say, what are you talking about? We've tested these laws. There's consistency. How could something have mass and not comply to these laws? A philosopher feels the same way. And they're also justified. They want to have a consistent system of thinking. At the end of the day, a human being is communicating with the divine. We experience a lower intensity of it. They experience a higher intensity of it. So that's the philosopher's understanding. Let's move on. So I think the key differences between theology and philosophy are made obvious. Let's move on to the mystical understanding. Now this term mystical is a little mysterious, isn't it? It's not often that you hear someone say mis mysticism. What are you talking about? What have you had for iftar? <laughs> what is this word? Mysticism refers in both in, in many religious traditions to a trend, to a way of life where the individual focuses on spirituality to reach knowledge. Pay attention here. Usually, in theology and in philosophy, we focus on knowledge, on refining our understandings, so then we can present guidelines for people. The argument is simple. They say, look, let's have a correct understanding of the world. After we have a correct ideology, a firm ideology, I'm going to give you instructions on how to live your life. So they go from knowledge to practice. But an arif, a mystic, does the opposite. He says there are levels and forms of knowledge that are only accessible where you work on yourself. So they require practice as an introduction to knowledge. They require self-discipline, mindfulness of every action and thought as an introduction to higher states of consciousness and knowledge we're good
This is why you see that they focus heavily on spiritual exercises. A mystic, a person who is after gnosis, which means ma'rifah, which means knowledge, a special kind of knowledge, they focus heavily on spiritual exercises. They have a lot of self-discipline. Tahdibun nafs, purifying the self. The argument is, and it's a truthful argument, the more you purify yourself, the more Allah will give you. This is supported by the ahadith as far as this go. The ahadith mention, act on by what you know and Allah will teach you what you do not know. This is a, the basis of irfan, of mysticism. You and I who are not mystics, maybe once again we have a few secret mystics here, Orafa in our gathering. We know about angels, for example, as an example, yeah? Through the Quran and the Hadith and these lectures and these books, oh, angels exist. A mystic doesn't suffice with that. He says, I want to have direct knowledge of these angels. I want to experience what it means to see angels. So they are after experiential knowledge. We hear about heaven and hell. We hear about barzakh. We hear about these realities, right? And we accept them because we are Muslims. We have come to believe that this is the true religion and this prophet is truthful. Therefore, what he says is also truthful. But the mystic says, I have more of a thirst. My thirst for knowledge is greater. I want to experience these things in this dunya. As in while I have this life, not after I die. So for the mystic, reality is something to be uncovered. There are levels and depths and layers that the mystic wants to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So through religious practices such as worship, spiritual exercise, discipline, mindfulness, they begin to slowly uncover truths of the world that is otherwise not accessible to us. And at the pinnacle and peak of this journey, or spiritual wayfaring as they call it, Sayyid or Suluk, Allah sits to be very metaphorical. Allah sits at the throne of all Gnosis. He is the ultimate quest to be understood and to commune with. Ultimately, the mystic, the highest station, according to mysticism, that you can reach is the station of Al Insanul Kamil, the complete human being. This is when the human being has become completely annihilated. His ego has be become annihilated. He does not see himself anymore. All he sees is God. He has become, in essence, one with God. Everything that he sees in this world, he sees God. He sees reflections of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through spiritual discipline and exercises and trying to suppress his ego that all he all that he does is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the station he reaches is the station of al insanul kamil this is where according to mystics where the prophets and the prophets and the imma have reached they are perfect complete human beings you might ask yourself, wait, if they are all perfect, complete, how is it that Rasulullah is better than Imam Ali and Imam Ali is better than the rest of the Imams and all the Imams are better than the Prophets if they are all in this state of completion and perfection? They will say, even at the level of perfection and completion, there are gr gradations, there are intensities. How do they explain this? Through the concept of wilaya. You and I have t heard the term wilaya before many times, correct? What, what usually comes to our mind? What's the preponderant meaning that we conceive of when we hear wilaya? What is it? Guardian. Guardian. 
احسنت امامه ليدر شيب امام علي ذا امامز ذي هاف ولاي اوفر اس ذي هاف كنترول اوفر اس اوثوريتي كوريكت بات ذس كونسبت اوف ولاي اكوردنج تو ذا ميستيكو انديرستاندينج has a deeper significance walaya which comes from the root word walaya means closeness really the very very basic meaning of walaya walaya if you go to you know how sometimes you look at a word and you look at the etymology on google and it tells you all the information about the word when you go really really deep into the word walaya The most basic meaning we can derive from it is closeness and nearness and proximity. So, for the mystic, yes, there is a legislative side of wilaya, which is what you mentioned, control, authority, God-given authority, but there is a deeper side to it which resembles the person's closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A wali, waliullah, which is usually translated as a friend of God is someone who has reached high stations of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we mentioned this earlier that the degrees of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are infinite you could be the best of creation the best of human beings rasulullah and you will have still room to work and become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So when mystics reach this state of the complete human being this state of ego annihilation spiritual fulfillment they have reached their objective after that there's still room to grow in this completion and this perfection in their degrees of wilaya or in other words their degrees of proximity and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how do we put this in the context of revelation it's very similar to the philosophical understanding but we'll look at the difference as well the mystic says revelation is the embodiment of the person's closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's an embodiment of his wilaya he has reached a certain station of wilaya a certain station of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that now he sees realities that others below him cannot see and that manifests in the form of revelation of seeing the angel of re- re- revelation jibril prophets are different from other spiritual saints because they have very capable souls they go and undergo much more rigorous spiritual discipline and exercises and for this reason allah chooses them to give them access to information and ma'rifa and knowledge that he gives no one else but it's the same journey it's the same journey a person who is an arif let's use a contempt a contemporary con I have to always ruin a word in every lecture. Someone help me out. Contemporary. Contemporary. Totalitarian. Do you remember that? <laughs> An Arif, a contemporary example, is Sheikh Bahjat. He's a saint of the highest degree. His wilaya, his proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of the highest stations but he is still very far away from the prophet and the imma he's very far away from receiving revelation in the way that the prophets received but ultimately they are all manifesting what wilaya closeness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what's the main difference then with arfan do you know what time was started ali 9:20 Okay, I have to end. Okay. The main difference between Arfan and philosophy and even kalam is the source of knowledge. The source of knowledge is very very different. In kalam, theology we relied on scripture. In philosophy we relied on reason. In Arfan and mysticism, 
we rely on spiritual knowledge that they call usually experiential knowledge. It's not something you read in books or something you make up rational arguments for. No, it's something you experience through practice. Practice, layers go. You see things. More practice, more layers go and you see things. So the source of the knowledge is the person himself, that spiritual person himself. He has experienced these things directly. In a way, this is the best form of knowledge. If you think about it, if you see something directly without any need to make arguments for it, you're like, I can see the thing itself. I don't need to tell you arguments. It's right in front of me. In a way, it's the strongest form of knowledge, correct? No need for arguments. But at the same time, it hinges on you and I and accepting the truthfulness of that claim. I can verify rational arguments by thinking about them. Say, okay, premise one, premise two, conclusion. But how am I going to verify the experiences of another person? As truthful as they might be. At the end of the day, these are his experiences, not mine. So, the mystical interpretation of Revelation and the whole world in general, because it comes from a person's experience that I cannot access, its epistemic value, how much knowledge it's able to give me, is lower than what reason provides and what the Quran and Sunnah provides. For those who also have these experiences, it's really good. They sit down and <laughs> they discuss all these things. But we're not amongst those circles, are we? What we receive from them is their literature. And their literature is usually presented in language that's symbolic. Because how are they going to express these realities they are seeing in ways that we do not understand? And that's why, by the way, a lot of the times they are misunderstood. And they lament that. They feel trapped. You know, sometimes there's a feeling that you can't express. There are sometimes ordinary human feelings that we cannot express. Correct? It's very hard sometimes to express our emotions and our sentiment towards someone in language. Let alone having a mystical, spiritual experience. So they resort to using symbol symbolisms and metaphors to explain it, but sometimes they are misunderstood. How... Useful are they for our discussion though? Because these experiences are in a way subjective and they don't bring us yaqeen, we don't have certainty. It might bring one of you yaqeen, you're like, I really trust Sheikh Bahjat, therefore I'm going to accept whatever. If he has relayed any of his experiences to us, I'm going to accept it. But another person will say, well, I, I, I love Sheikh Bahjat. I love all these saints, but... I haven't seen it for myself. I can't have certainty. I can't have yaqeen. But at the level of speculation, something below yaqeen, it gives us, it paints us a picture of the world that can nonetheless aid us. So a revelation, to summarize, in the mystical interpretation, is the uncovering of layers of existence and reality, whereby the mystic, through spiritual exercises, he reaches there. But the prophets, because they have the most capable of souls and the most rigorous of exercises, they reach levels that no one has reached and that's why they receive revelation. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Of course, there's much more complexities in this field of Irfan. There's a lot going on. In about the time I had, I just painted you a picture. So next time also you hear someone speak about these terms, you know where he's coming from. You know where he is basing these ideas upon. We've given a brief overview of these three approaches. One main other approach remains, which is the modern approach to looking at Revelation. But we're going to delay these to the later parts of the lecture series because we're going to focus on them more. With regards to philosophy and theology and Arfan, especially the later two, we're not going to really, uh, what I just said should suffice. Because to go into the deeper arguments will take much more time, explanation. It will have to be like a proper class, right? I can't do it in one or two sessions. 
And I don't think, I think it's more beneficial that we use more of the theological approach, which goes back to the Quran and the Sunnah. So we as Muslims and the Shia are familiar with what the Quran and the Sunnah say about revelation. We will borrow concepts from philosophy and mysticism to aid our explanation. Okay? Inshallah, that's clear. I, last year, I think it was, or maybe it was longer than last year, I shared a translation of Ayatollah Kashmiri. Rahmatullahi alayhi. He was, a, he was one of the saints of Allah, one of the mystics that truly had a lot to offer to the Muslim world and his followers. And he had these sets of recommendations for Ramadan, which, alhamdulillah, I was able to, let's see, the 2022, two years ago. Let's go over a few of these tonight, and let's just make a few comments here and there and see how much we can benefit from these. So the first recommendation he has is quality over quantity. I'm going to read the recommendation and then add a few comments. He says, Rahmatullahi alayhi, don't simply complete verses and supplications. Rather, pursue digesting them. Take in small bites of spiritual food so that it becomes part of your soul. Our biggest problem is our superficiality towards religion. For example, think about how many years of fasting have passed you which you have spent eagerly in excessive reading and recitation. Where you have reached, where have you reached with that and what did you achieve from it? In the beginning of the month, be sure to make an intention that your fasts are only for the sake of Allah, only Allah. Practice the etiquettes and recommended acts of fasting only to the point that you have energy and spirit for. Now, this is Ayatollah Kashmiri, a giant of, contemporary giant of spirituality and mysticism and akhlaq. What sticks out boldly from that advice is seeking spirituality and acts of worship as far as your energy goes and as, as, as far as you have appetite for. There are two two approaches to spirituality and acts of worship. There are some scholars like him, and they're all successful, by the way, yani they have reached high stations of spirituality. There are some scholars like him that emphasize on, on doing, excuse me, on doing spiritual acts of worship as far as you, you have appetite for. Once you feel like you have no patience for this, stop. Dua Kumail, you read one page, two page, you're like, oh, I'm bored now. This is getting tiring. Stop. Don't force yourself. Don't create a negative association with the Quran and what you're doing. This is their advice. As long as you have energy and appetite, do it. The other side, there are scholars who say, look, it's not the case that every time you're going to have something spiritual. Am I wearing this the wrong way around? No, I'm not. Thank God. <laughs> it's not that you're going to, every time you read Salat, you're going to be, you know, crying and, and epiphany and euphoria and union with God. You're hum we're human beings, ups and downs. They say focus on completing it. Even if that time... You're not really experiencing a lot of spiritual energy and appetite. Put the effort in. At the end of the day, you have to do some ubudiyah. You have to show some submission. If you're only following where you have energy and appetite for, well, it becomes a bit about you, right? Sometimes, force yourself a bit. Push yourself a bit. So you can become accustomed to more. The middle road between these two ways... I think is the best of ways. At the end of the day, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Inna lil qulubi idbaran wa iqbalan. Your hearts sometimes are very ready. They have a lot of appetite. In those moments, the Imam recommends that we do mustahabbat. Not only do the wajibat, 
do the mustahabbat as much as you can because your heart is ready it's receptive but when it turns its back it's the heart sometimes it's tired maybe it needs sleep maybe it needs food maybe there's something from outside bothering it the imam says when it turns back suffice with the wajibat only the obligatory acts so the first approach is correct in that sense and it's supported by this statement of Imam Ali. But at the same time, we are in the month of Ramadan. We are in the month of worship. Correct? Our Sunni brothers and sisters, yes, they are practicing a bid'ah in praying taraweeh in jama'ah, but praying those number of raka'at is recommended. We have the same prayer in our Shia tradition. In fact, the most recommended act for every night of Ramadan is those prayers. I think the first 10 nights it's 20 and then it increases and then Layali al Qadr it's 100. But it's every night they have these prayers. If we're going to just become complacent and say, oh, look, I'm not feeling it. I told like Kashmiri told me, Imam Ali told me not to, you know, my heart is turning its back on me, therefore I'm not going to be performing. If we always adopt that approach, we're just going to be lazy. We're not going to improve. There has to be a degree of pushing as well. Not to the point that you don't want to return to it tomorrow, but to the point that you know you'll come back tomorrow. There's sometimes you do so much, you're like, Oof, thank God Laylatul Qadr is finished. <laughs> right? That was a lot. Even that is good, to be honest. I'm not one of the people that says, yani, at the end of the day, we're, we have to do a lot of reflection and thinking. We'll come to those in future directions from this great saint. But at the end of the day, we've been given this night, for argument's sake, Laylatul Qadr, to show our ubudiyya and our submission, even if it's a bit difficult. So what? Allah sees that while it's difficult for this servant of mine, he is carrying out these instructions. Maybe you're not even feeling it. Maybe you're a bit tired. Allah looks at that state and says, Look, despite his tiredness and his fatigue and not having appetite, he's pushing through for me. Not to the point that I said that you completely get turned off, but also not to the point where we use this as an argument to say, Look, brother, I'm going to spend the whole night thinking. Ibadatu sa'a afdalu min afwan tafakkur is sa'a thinking for one hour my brother is better than 60 years of worship do you think the imams didn't know this why is imam ali praying 100,000 1,000 raka'at every day why is imam al-sajjad called sayyid al-sajjadeen do you think they don't know this they do the point of these ahadith is that don't only focus on those things ibadah worship is empty without reflection the mukh of ibadah, the core of ibadah is thinking and reflection. But that doesn't mean you just do sit down and reflect all the time and don't perform any acts of worship. So to conclude from his instruction, even when it comes to the Qur'an, don't say, I'm going to read a page and think about it. La Habibi, read a khatim, read a juzu, a hazab, whatever, read, push yourself a bit. We can read Harry Potter, we can watch Netflix for an hour. Surely we can stick with the Qur'an for an hour. Surely. Don't tell me that you can't. Or sh I know you can. I know we can. It requires a bit of pushing sometimes. We don't become so complacent, lazy and silly and entitled. That even when it comes to a month like this, we, we feel entitled towards Allah. Subhanahu wa Allah, I did two pages. It's good enough for you. That men the mentality that kind of thinking builds could be a mentality of takabbur at the end of the day. Billah. Whereas ibadah and Ramadan is the month of submission, the month of worship. The middle way, combining these two things, requires that we do push ourselves a little bit. For this to become a habit at the end of the day. Things don't just become a habit if you uh, remain in your comfort zone, correct? Everyone knows this from all these motivational reels you watch. <laughs> we all know this. The comfort zone gives us nothing. How come we can apply this idea in exercise and in careers, but we don't apply it to worship? We have to leave the comfort zone a little bit. 
to gain. We have to go against the friction. Maybe the friction is created by the nafs. Maybe the friction is created by, by... It's like a coach. Our relationship with the nafs, we are the head coach and we're training someone. You push them a little bit, but you also watch their limits. Because you don't want to create an injury. If you tear a spiritual muscle, then he can't train tomorrow. But if you don't push it enough, yeah boys, if you don't push it to hypertrophy, it won't grow. In the same way, the spiritual muscle of worship will not grow if it's not torn a little bit. If it's just going to keep lifting the same weight, it will stay where it is. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the opportunity of doing worship with reflection, with depth, with sincerity, and also giving us the, 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 the strength to do more of it and have a presence of the heart as much as possible. We also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve the people of Gaza, the people of Palestine, the discomforts, the starvation, the, the violence, the genocide they are facing, Bihaq. These by the right of these sacred nights. Rahimallahu man qara al Fatiha ma as salawat.